Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Stay tuned to hear how you can get a copy of this program and other helpful documents. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Tim. Like Tim said, I'm Carrie McCoy, and it's time for me to get up in your business. Before we start, I want to introduce the people at the table. We have who you just heard from, Tim Bowen, our technician, who will be managing the board and taking your calls. Say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. And recording our show today to make a podcast available next week is our technician, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. No problem. If right now you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch us live on flagandbanner.com's Facebook page. Uh, unlike many reality shows, this is really unfiltered reality radio. You're getting the real deal. Uh, this show, Up In Your Business with Kerry McCoy, began with Entrepreneurs in Mind, a platform for me, a small business owner and a guest, to pay forward our experiential knowledge in a conversational way. As with all new endeavors, it has some unexpected outcomes, like the show's wide appeal is to everyone. We're all inspired by everyday people's American-made stories. Another is that business is creative. I resist using the words art form, but... If it walks like a duck and sounds like a duck, then it's a duck. I think business is creative. And last behind each of my successful guests is the heart of a teacher. Joining me today is a fellow eccentric, defined by Webster as a person or their behavior that is unconventional and slightly strange. The Honorable Judge Vic Fleming is that. Sure, he is a judge who writes, teaches, and plays golf. That's mainstream. But he's also a judge that writes songs, plays the guitar, and constructs crossword puzzles for the New York Times and other publications. All the aforementioned descriptives sum up the man we're going to talk to today. If you're just tuning in for the first time, you may be asking yourself, what's this lady's story and why does she have a radio show? Well, Tim is here to tell you. Thank you, Carrie. Over 40 years ago, with only $400, Carrie McCoy founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, the business has grown and changed dramatically from door-to-door -door sales to telemarketing to mail order and catalog sales, and now Flag and Banner relies heavily on the internet, including our newest feature, live chatting. Each decade required a change in sales strategy and procedures. Her business and leadership knowledge grew with time and experience, as well as the confidence to branch out into multimedia marketing that began with our nonprofit Dreamland Ballroom, as well as our in house publication, Brave Magazine, and now this very radio show that you're listening to. Each week on the show, you'll hear candid conversations between her and our guests about real world experiences on a variety of businesses and topics that we hope you'll find interesting. Carrie says that many business rules like treat your employees well, know your profit margin, and have a succession plan can be applied across most industry. What I find encouraging is her example that hard work pays off. Did you know that for nine years while starting Flag and Banner, she supplemented her income with many part-time jobs? And that just shows that her persistence, perseverance, and patience prevailed. Today, Flag and Banner has 10 departments, and I have 25 coworkers. It reminds us all that small businesses are the fuel of our country's economic engine, and they empower people's lives. If you would like to ask Carrie a question or share your experience or story, you can send an email to questions at upyourbusiness.org. Thank you, Tim. My guest today is the Honorable Vic Fleming and judge of Little Rock, Arkansas's Municipal Court, 2nd Division. He began his college career as an English literature snob and holds a BA from Davidson College in North Carolina. He ended his degree accumulation with a JD from the University of Arkansas's Business School of Law, where he has been an adjunct professor since 2003. Throw out any preconceived ideas you may have about judges being stoic and cold, He's not really a snob. This judge writes humorous articles, books, and original poetry. Vic Fleming fervently pursues a wide expanse of interest. His hobbies include golf, playing the guitar, writing songs, and my favorite, he's a crossword puzzle junkie. About 20 years ago, Judge Vic decided to take one of his hobbies to a new level. He began to create and submit crossword puzzles for publication in the New York Times. He is now one of the two or 300 person elite group of crossword puzzle constructors in the United States. That's something. That's really something big. And it's, it's such a small group. And yes, 
Those word aficionados have an, an, have an annual convention and competition, the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, held just last week in Stamford, Connecticut. In 2006, this same convention had an unusual outcome for our eccentric Judge Vic. Some young cinematographers were there filming a documentary that would come to be called Wordplay. During the convention's friendly competition, American Crossword Idol, the filmmakers heard Vic play and perform his original song titled, If You Don't Come Across. And they liked it so much, they licensed the song and used it for the end of the movie's credit roll. It is an honor to welcome to the table the well-read, well-rounded, and funny Honorable Judge Vic Fleming of Little Rock, Arkansas, who brought me iced tea today. Thank you very much, Vic. Thank you for inviting me, and I've enjoyed uh, reading about and hearing about uh, your story, and I think it's marvelous. Somewhere along the line, you decided you wanted a radio show, and you got it. 2016, and, and September. And seven people in here having fun on a Friday afternoon. That's just amazing. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. It's shocking, isn't it? It really is. I know. Everybody comes over here and they're like, wow, this is really together. And you really did your homework on me. Boy. Oh, I did. I Listen. need to have you on my team. I wouldn't you... want you on the other side for sure. <laughs> I think that's almost a compliment. It is. <laughs> I loved reading about you. I, there's so much written about you. I couldn't stop, actually. Um, you grew up in Mississippi. Went to college in North Carolina and married a Lake Village girl, which, through the persuasion of your father-in-law, is how you ended up moving to Arkansas. Can you tell us about that? Um, my wife, Susan Burnside, and I grew up 20 miles from each other. I was in Greenville, Mississippi. She was right across the river in Lake Village, Arkansas. We grew up 20 miles apart and didn't meet until we were 21 years old, and I had moved away from Greenville. Uh, my sister had married... Uh, a guy from Lake Village, and I was back visiting my sister in the summer of 1972, right before our senior years in college. And my sister got me a blind date um, with Susan. Um, and then later the same summer, a mutual friend of Susan's and mine was having engagement parties, and she and I got together and went to some of those parties. And then we didn't see each other again until the following um, winter holiday over Christmas. And we started dating seriously in December of 1972, and in December of 73, we got married. Wow. She had been on, uh, she had been, she had graduated from uh, Rhodes College in Memphis mm -hmm. and had uh, started graduate school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And, um, and you went to school at North, North Carolina, but uh, not Chapel Hill. No, I had been at Davidson, and when I finished at Davidson, I moved on over to Chapel Hill, and we lived together in Chapel Hill after we were married. And Susan, uh, well, had a choice of law schools, either going back to Mississippi to Ole Miss or coming to Little Rock. But you didn't originally want to do law. You wanted to do English Lit. Right. I was kidding when I said English Lit snob, but you are so well read. Well, that's true. I was, I was admitted to an English uh, graduate program at the University of North Carolina, but uh, I was playing golf on a regular basis with a guy who was finishing up his Ph.D. in English, and he was brilliant, and he couldn't find a job. So my due diligence told me that people were getting uh, PhDs in English at that time, weren't getting jobs. And so I had to call my mother and say, you were right after all. Because my mother would always tell me as I was growing up, you need to be a lawyer because you love to argue so much. And, and what I would, would you say? I would reply, I do not love to argue. There's no evidence to support that. And <laughs> Sounds like a lawyer to me. But, so I, I withdrew from that English program before I even went to the first class and worked for another year in Chapel Hill while Susan was finishing up her graduate program. And then she got a job in Little Rock, and I got into UALR Law School. And you, you need to be a great reader to be a lawyer. If you say so. Don't you? Well, there's a lot An of reading. An avid reader. There's certainly a lot of reading. And uh, the, you know, the first year of law school, you do a lot of reading of old cases, uh, as well as new cases. But you really have to master a lot of old stuff, read, you know, written in antiquated language and, um, and so you got a so you moved, so you moved your wife and and yourself to little rock arkansas you enrolled at the uh university of all of arkansas school of law here in little rock right it was ualr's first it was ualr's first law school class the year before the school had been the university of arkansas at Fayetteville knight division oh. but ualr had acquired the law school um and it was the first day program uh at the uh, school, and it was downtown Little Rock. 
Uh, the classes met in the building that is adjacent now to the Doubletree Hotel. That's now those expensive apartments? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the uh, Pulaski County and Arkansas Law Center. What Pulaski a beautiful County. view you had. Yeah, um, but that's where the law, all the law school classes took place at that time. So in school, I read that a professor said to you, in your third year of law school, at the end of class, he said he wanted everyone to jot down what they thought an ideal legal career would look right, right. like. Right. That was Professor Ken Gould, who just retired from the law school about five years ago and still can be found up there on the uh, third or fourth floor in his office. Uh, every, just <laughs> They're like, you're, every day. you're retired. Go home. Right. But we had this one class and he said, everybody pull out a sheet of paper, take 15 minutes and jot down as formally or informally, uh, however you want to do it what you believe would be an ideal legal career. And 14 and a half minutes later, my sheet of paper was still blank when he said you got 30 seconds left. And so I scratched down one third trial practice, one third judge, one third legal education. And we turned them in, I think, and then got them back the next class, divided into small groups and maybe had a discussion. But I kept that sheet of paper with me for 15 years. And I looked at it every year in December and said, am I going to be true to this? Am I, how am I going to divide it up? Is it 10, 10, and 10? I was thinking very linearly about it. Um, but in around year um, 18, there was an opening for a judgeship. It wasn't anything near uh, what my law practice had been. But uh, I did some discernment and believed that I was supposed to run for that judgeship. I got elected. And uh, ironically, five years later, I signed up to audit the course called Law and Literature at the law school. And uh, the, the course was going to meet from 7 to 9 on uh, Thursday nights, and that was, that was fine with me. I got a call from the academic dean of the law school on Monday saying that the professor who was to teach the course wasn't going to be able to teach it, and he was going to have to cancel the class unless I would agree to teach it. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to teach it. I haven't, haven't taken it yet. But I agreed to teach it from the other professor's um, one year. syllabus for a year and we'll get the other professor back well the other professor took early retirement and i've taught it every year since then and that was in what year that was in 2003 wow, and i, a and I became story. a judge in 1997 so so you actually at 15 years or 18 years you said of private practice lawyer then you had then you ran for office when we come back i want to hear you tell everybody that story because you told me the story and then somewhere along the line you got asked to substitute teach and it's been there ever since. Right. Well, and so that's when I stopped thinking linearly about this one third, yeah. one third, one third. I've, um, Do it all at the same time. Right. You didn't put cr- you didn't put cr- crossword <laughs> aficionado. What is it? Aficionato. Affici- affici- aficionato. Actually, aficionato we'll, on there. I didn't put cruciverbalist on there. What does that mean? Cruciverbalism is the art of making uh, crossword puzzles, and it also uh, includes the aficionados of uh, the people who are really seriously into crosswords. But the word is cruciverbalism. In fact, the, uh, the book, the first book that I read about making crossword puzzles was called The Complete Cruciverbalist, with complete being spelled C O M P L E A T. Why? I don't know. I don't remember. But uh, I remember the uh, author, the two authors of the book were Stan Kurzban and Mel uh, Rosen. And Mel Rosen, which is an icon in the yeah. crossword community, uh, Mel contacted me shortly after my first uh, few puzzles had been published. And he said, uh, he was the editor at that time of, a, of an annual book that Random House put out. And he said, I want you to submit some puzzles to me. And it's a selfish reason. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because I want to be the first person to have bought crossword puzzles from two Arkansas judges. And he told me that he had bought uh, crossword puzzles from Justice George Rose Smith of the Arkansas Supreme Court, who was well known to have had several Sunday New York Times crossword puzzles published back in the 70s and 80s. Um, And he said he knew George Rose Smith and had bought puzzles from him in the 70s and 80s. I had no idea that was a judge pastime thing. Wow. Well, it's not. I, it, I mean, I, I, the, uh... as far as I know, he, Judge Smith and I are the only two judges who have ever done it. And I, oddly enough, I interviewed with Judge Smith in 1997 for a clerkship in his, uh, you know, with the Supreme Court, with his office. And I did not get the job. But we did talk about crossword puzzles <laughs> in the interview. 
<laughs> yeah, we've got so much to talk about. Let's take a quick break so I can sign off with my Facebook people. We're going to stay live on YouTube, I think, aren't we, the whole show? But we're going to sign off with Facebook. Um, we've got some songs that our guest wrote today. Do we want to do that at the break, do you think? Yes, we have one called Uncharted Waters, well, and we'll on. play a sample of during the break. Okay, hold on. When we come back, we'll continue our diverse conversation with author, teacher, speaker, musician, and crossword constructor, Judge Vic Fleming of the Municipal Court in Little Rock, Arkansas. And at the bottom of the hour, we'll take calls. So get ready. We'll give you the number then. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of flagandbanner.com. If you miss any part of the show and want to learn more about Up In Your Business, go to flagandbanner.com and click radio show. Or you can subscribe through YouTube, SoundCloud, or iTunes, or whatever favorite podcast app you use, simply by searching for flagandbanner.com. Lots of listening options. We'll be right back. Turns out we both were lying, wishing we were older, and we both had plans. To act much bolder from a distance Our mothers and fathers watched us Navigate uncharted waters Uncharted waters On the boardwalk holding hands Uncharted waters Drawing crosswords in the sand Talked about school how to be cool the places we'd like to go but my heart pushed off into uncharted waters for one short week we shared an ocean bottles and bottles suntan lotion jukebox music in the party room slow dancing to her favorite tunes, uncharted waters, promising that we'd ride uncharted waters, making out on Friday night, talked about school, breaking the rules, and places we'd like to go, and my heart raced on through uncharted waters. Saturday morning, Rachel's car was gone. A full day early, she was headed home. I just stood there, torn apart. Nursing my first broken heart for one short week. We had shared an ocean, overdosing. On raw emotion, I got Rachel's letter in a week and then never heard from her again. Uncharted waters, promises we don't keep, uncharted waters, waiting in when it's way too deep. I talk about school. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with author, teacher, and district judge Vic Fleming in Little Rock, Arkansas. That was great, Vic. That song of yours was great. That was you singing, you playing the guitar. Thank you. Thank you. At the bottom of the hour, everybody, in about 15 minutes, Vic's got his guitar here, and he's going to sing us a song on the radio. You know, they never sound as good on the radio as they do <laughs> in there in the studio, but we're still going to do it. It's going to be fun. So don't leave us. Hang on. He's going to... He's going to play a song for us at the bottom of the hour. All right, we, where we left off. You were a lawyer for 15 years, then you ran for office, and sometime in 2003 you became a professor at uh, the School of Law at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock. Um, before we jump into your run for office, which you told me that story, which I really like, what was your favorite part of private pa practice? Why should anybody go into law? Um, well, I think uh, law is um, 
uh, is all about uh, doing two things, really. Number one is problem solving. And number two is trying to, um, tr trying to restore to someone something that they lost or to maintain for someone something that uh, they are not supposed to lose. That someone's trying to take away from them. Nah, yes, not something always. like that. Uh, but more often, the, but, but it all starts with problem solving. That's probably goes with your hobby of crossword puzzles. That's problem solving. Life is a puzzle. Let's fill in the blanks. I watched Wordplay <laughs> this morning, the movie that you're in. Oh, you did? I wow. did. I've okay. seen it before, but uh -huh. I rewatched it this morning. And there was a guy in there that said that, what did he say? He said that people innately, people, he thinks people like to work, I can't remember exactly, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something about he thinks people like to work crossword puzzles because it satisfies this uh, innate desire to solve problems. Right. And then John Delphin in there says, give me blank spaces and I want to fill them in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you made the decision to run for office. And you told me the story because I have to tell everybody you're such a prepared guy. You called me earlier in the week and said, what am I supposed to, what are we talking about? And I said, we're talking about you. And you said, oh, that's easy. And then he told me about five, 20 minutes worth of stories. They were all great. And the one that you did tell me was one about running for the office. And I said, you've got to tell it on the radio. So you decided to run for office. Why? Well, when I was, um, when I was running for office for a municipal judge, which was fondly known as a traffic judge's position, the position was open because the incumbent had resigned in June. So there were six months of an interim judge. And four people were running, and we were all running essentially on the same platform. And the law at that time provided that the winner of a plurality of the votes would win the office. What's plurality mean? Plurality is getting the most of, of however many it is when it's more than two. When it's uh, so more it's, than it's, two. It's, okay. it's more, so it's less than a majority. Okay. There was not a provision in the law for a runoff between the top two vote getters. And so everybody was running pretty much on the same platform. And... Uh, one of the other candidates had gotten a major endorsement from uh, various groups. Uh, another had gotten the endorsement of the, um, of, of the big newspaper. And another, who was a traffic court prosecutor, had gotten the endorsement of the police department and the Fraternal Order of Police, and I had gotten no endorsements. <laughs> but I had uh, pledged to work harder than anybody else, and to demonstrate that, I said I would work until the polls closed on Election Day. So on election day, I was working my way across town from polling place to polling place, spending 15 to 30 minutes in each place, shaking hands, giving out literature 100 feet from the, from the door. And I got caught in a traffic jam at 5 o'clock. It was bumper to bumper traffic. And Took you're a, trying to go like out to West Little Rock or something. I was headed out to Southwest Little Rock, and I got on Western Hills Boulevard, bumper to bumper traffic, and found that I was... Uh, right next to the United uh, the Western Hills United Methodist Church, which was a polling place. I just it was not on my list of places to be. So I pulled in there. Uh, the parking lot was cold and uh, dark, and it was starting to mist rain. I went inside and uh, checked with the uh, people who were running the place, and they told me how many people had voted and how many people they expected, and they only expected 10 or 15 more voters in the next two hours. So I went out to leave, but there was a car coming in the lot, a couple of cars coming in the lot. And both of the people, both of the couples in these cars, I gave them my literature and asked for their votes, and they both commented, you're all alone in this cold, dark, lonely parking lot two hours before the polls close. We're going to give you our vote. So I thought I'll just stay here until 10 or 15 minutes goes by without anybody because there's still bumper to bumper traffic on the street. Well, I was able to count, and I spoke to the last 99 people who voted there. There was a steady stream of cars for the next two hours. You solicited 99 I, people. I gave my literature and asked for the votes of the last 99 people at a place where I didn't intend to be. And at midnight, the election commission told me that I was ahead by 81 votes. Now, and they still tell a, me they hard still, work doesn't pay off. They still had 1,000 votes to count that were in the absentee uh, yeah. pool when they weren't, wouldn't get to those votes until much later and when the absentee ballots were counted my my lead went from 81 votes up to like 253 or something like that which got me the nickname landslide uh, <laughs> but it also got me the position and uh you know knock on wood i haven't had any opposition for re-election in five runs for re-election so. that's unbelievable so i'm in my 22nd year now that's wonderful you use the word landslide in any of your crossword puzzles <laughs> I don't remember. Probably, though. 
That's a great story, isn't it? That's just everybody that's successful works hard. That's just the key to everything. Um, I should say also, I did get one endorsement, though. The Sunday before the Tuesday of the election, John Brummett endorsed me. Oh. John Brummett was always a major political columnist, and uh, uh, the fact that he endorsed me at the very end was could have been uh, – crucial, but I'll just say when you win by only 250 votes with 59,000 votes cast, every group in town takes credit for your victory. <laughs> so for four years, I had people tell me, we got you elected now. So. <laughs> oh, I bet. Let me off on that speeding ticket, please. <laughs> we got you elected. Uh, you said, and I quote, I do love my work as judge. In an average week, I'll have one-on-one -on -one dialogue with 300 people about the cases that have brought them to court. I try to treat each as an opportunity to help that person make better life choices. Okay, I remember saying that or writing that. That is a big job. I do that at my job. I work with people and try to help them make better life choices, and it frustrates me. How do you do that? every week day after day do you not find it frustrating um i try not because i know some are repeat offenders right and you're like joe what are you doing back in here i told you what to do you didn't follow my i would say that i experience frustration or any other negative emotion on such a minuscule percentage of cases that it's really not worth even worrying about lovely um you're, you're gonna they're gonna be times when things don't go right but uh very, very, Lovely. very, very small percentage. I wish everybody could see you because you look <laughs> that way, actually. You look like a person that doesn't sweat the small stuff, you know? Um, Little Rock has 25,000 traffic tickets a year. Some of the charges are driving while intoxicated, driving without a license, driving without liability insurance, fleeing the sea of an accident, racing and reckless driving. I think I've had every one of those. <laughs> Well, you no, know, I'm just the, kidding. The, uh, <laughs> the, the offense that we have probably more than any other in terms of plurality and wouldn't be a majority of the cases, but the thing that we, the two things that we see most often is driving without a license or with a suspended license. And the second thing we see is, and this is true nationwide of judges at this level, we see failure to appear. Oh, really? Yeah. What happens then? You get a yeah. warrant for your arrest. Well, they, 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 they're a failure to appear, failure to pay, failure to comply with court orders is the... Warrant for your yeah. arrest. Well, sometimes it's a warrant for the arrest. Uh, most often most often it is if, if all of the paperwork indicates that the person had every reason to know that they were supposed to be there and they were not there, that's what they're charged with. Very few ultimately get convicted of fail mm -hmm. to appear, though, mm -hmm. simply because... If we had to have a trial on every charge of failure to appear, we'd be there till midnight. Mm -hmm. And so generally the prosecutor will bargain, plea bargain, to dismiss a failure to appear in return for a plea of guilty to whatever the underlying charge is. I've actually done that. And a policeman knocked on my door and said, there's a warrant for your arrest. You failed to, you failed to appear for a traffic oh, ticket or something. A policeman came to your house? I swear to God. I swear to God. 19, uh, 19, and I went in front of George, Judge Watt. 1975. Okay, so well, you 1976. Must, well, he must have sent the police officer because the, the practice now, they don't ever go out and serve warrants now. They just will no. serve the warrants if a person gets another ticket. No, that was 40 years ago. You know, that's a long time ago. And I rode in the back of the police car, and he apologized to me when he put me in the back. I said, I'm sorry, I have to put you in the back seat. I said, that's okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. I know. I don't even remember what it was for. I think it was for not paying a ticket, a, 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 a speeding ticket. Yeah, it was a lot different, I guess, back then. But you were already in the law practice in, that, in 1976. You were already practicing law in Little Rock, right? Yeah, you know, you said a minute ago that I was practicing law for 15 years. When people ask me, I always tell them I practiced law for 20 years, 18 with a license. Oh. Because mm -hmm. my second year of law school, I was lucky enough to get employed by a law firm oh. uh, and worked for law firms or lawyers uh, my entire second and third year of law school and was thrown right into the fire or the frying pan. It was hot in both places. But you know, whatever I was doing, it was close enough to practice in law that I was... Uh, I thought you were going to say because people kept asking you for advice all the time and you were having to give free advice. But you actually had a, had a job working for right. Judge Watt. You critiqued uh, Judge uh, Woods. Was that, was well, that, that was, part that of was, what you're that talking was still, about? No, no, that was still when I was in law school. Oh, that okay. was a, a law review story. But 
my, uh, my last year and a half of law school, I was working for Jim Hamilton, who at the time was uh, city attorney of North Little Rock. And the, the entire third year of law school, I actually spent prosecuting traffic cases under the, his supervision. And uh, normally that supervision would be in person, but the, the judge of the uh, North Little Rock uh, traffic court, after my first four or five times of prosecuting cases in that court, told uh, Mr. Hamilton, he said, you can just stay in your office. If I have any trouble with him, I'll call you. I'll consider him to be under your supervision even though you're not on site. So that was great experience. So I'm going to ask you one last question. Then we're going to go to a break, and you're go and the break is going to be you playing us a song on the radio. So everybody, don't leave. One last question. Describe what your day looks like as a judge. What it looks like? Well, mm -hmm. uh, I get to the get to the office between eight and eight thirty. Sometimes a little earlier than that. And uh, we the we start court at eight thirty, and we go until uh, the last case is finished. Uh, we usually start with a jail docket. We see people on closed circuit television, people who have been served with warrants in the last 24 hours or so. We see those uh, people first. And um, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday are days that we have trials. Wednesday is what we call plea and arraignment or first appearances. On Wednesdays, we'll do somewhere between 150 and 200 uh, cases. And uh, God, the, uh, the other days, we'll do an average of about 50 a day. Sometimes we have more like 100 set, but a lot of the cases that we have set are these failures, the mm -hmm. orders to show cause or warrants for arrest, appearance agreements on warrants. Uh, and we have a huge percentage who do not show up for those. But uh, How do you keep all that power from going to your head? <laughs> you just don't. Well, I mean, you just don't. I, I, don't, I try not to think of it as power, uh, but since you asked this question, I'll tell you. Come visit me in my, in my office, my chamber sometime, and I'll show you. The last thing I see before I walk into the courtroom every day is a portrait of a child dressed as a clown. And it was, paint, was painted by uh, my mother's younger sister, Lucille, my Aunt Lucille, who was a crossword puzzle fan. And it was for her that I wrote the crossword puzzle song for her 85th birthday. That's in wordplay? That I, that I ultimately did in wordplay. But uh, I saw this picture of this clown. I thought it was a clown. I ultimately concluded it's a child dressed as a clown. Saw it in her home in about 1997 or 8. I'd been in office for a couple of years. And, I, and she had it in the back part of her house where nobody could see it. And I said, how much do you want for that clown on the wall in that back bathroom? And she said, $500. And I pulled out my checkbook and started writing a check. She said, oh, I'm kidding. You can have it. I've never liked it. So I said, well, I want to I have it to be the last thing I look at before I go into the courtroom so that I never am tempted to take myself too seriously. Oh, wow. So, what a good what a good reminder. That's nice. And, That's of course, I always think about my Aunt Lucille, and when I think about her, I think about my mother because they were um, with two years apart. Uh, they shared a hospital room in December of 1951 and gave birth 12 hours apart to myself at 6 in the afternoon and my twin cousin, uh, at six in the morning. Your twin cousin. My twin cousin, Shelly uh, <laughs> Matthews, who lives in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I just, uh, my wife and I visited her on, on the way to our vacation uh, in Florida about uh, just about three or four weeks ago. Is your mother and aunt still alive? No. Mm -hmm. no so you keep it there gone, to remind you to do it. They've been gone a while. But Shelly and I rush to call each other each year to wish each other happy birthday, which one of us, whichever one of us calls the other first. So. <laughs> But, but she's always older. She's always 12 hours older. So. <laughs> Your twin cousin. That's right. All right, it's time to take a break. And at this break, Vic's going to play us a song. If you're just tuning in. After uh, the break, right? Well, or no, I'm going to do gonna this. play during the break? You are going to be our, you wanna, is he going to be our break? Or we yeah, gonna, yeah, let's have him be the break. He's going to be the break. Yeah. There you go. Um, we'll continue our conversation with author teacher, musician, speaker, Judge Vic Fleming of the District Court in Little Rock, Arkansas. We're going to talk about crossword puzzles when we come back. There's a lot more to making one than you think. And we will hear Judge Vic's President Clinton crossword puzzle story because he made a crossword puzzle with our president, our Arkansas president. And uh, when we come back, he's going to play for a little bit. And when we come back, if you have any questions for me or my guest, Tim will give you the phone in number right after the break. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy.
If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more about Up In Your Business, go to flagandbanner.com and click Radio Show. Or you can subscribe through YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app simply by searching for flagandbanner.com. Lots of listening options. We'll be right back with the phone number for calling in. And now you'll hear Vic Fleming. What's the name of the song? If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. I love it. The pay or play extender is Ola, not Olay. And it's anti that you want, not anti, when the clue is pay to play. But Lou is a John on the British Isle. Ryan and Co. both ran the mile. And if you don't come across, I'm going to be down. If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. Your love to me is a mystery, and the clues are all around. If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. You're an easy fill on Mondays, but when the weekends come, your themeless open spaces make me feel so dumb. Triple stacks absurdity, pop culture and obscurity. If you don't come across, I'm gonna be down. Now everybody sing. If you don't come across, I'm gonna be down. If you don't come across, I'm gonna be down. Your love to me is a mystery and the clues are all around. If you don't come across, I'm gonna be down. That was so fun. Good voice, Liz, too. Now, I got to tell you the story. You mentioned it earlier. Um, are we off a break now? Yeah. We're yeah, back absolutely. On. So, uh, Patrick Creedon and Christine O'Malley, the producer and director of Wordplay, uh, told me that they had had a professional musician record the song, a guy named Sean O'Malley, who was uh, Christine's brother. And they wanted to use it in the closing credits of the film, Wordplay, which was did really well. It went to the Sundance Film Festival in 2006. And had a theatrical run and during which it grossed over $3 million at the box office. Wow, nice. Um, but uh, the, 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 the credits of the film began to roll and a wonderful song by Gary Lewis, an old-time uh, folk rock uh, country musician called Every Word. Gary Lewis's word song, Every Word, runs for two and a half minutes and then 60 seconds of my song as recorded by Sean O'Malley. At the very end of the credits, so my song played to empty theaters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> a really good version. <laughs> Why did they do two songs? Because it was just long, I guess, because the credits were just so long, they had to, they, it just took <clears throat> up two songs. Or you something. know, Patrick and Christine became great friends as a result of that whole experience. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, they wanted me to help them get an interview with, uh, with President Clinton so that he could be in the movie, and he agreed to do that, and so they gave me a little credit for that. But uh, I never asked them about the decision to have two songs. I mean, it's just, I, I assume that it had to do with the length of the credits. Yeah, I guess, uh, they, uh, I guess they paid you for the license, for the rights to that song, right? You're a lawyer. You did draw up a contract well, to get some money, didn't you? <laughs> well, actually, they sent me a contract, and we talked about it, and I quoted them a number. I won't tell you what it is, but I told them, you don't have to pay me unless and until your movie grosses at least $3 million at the box office. Bingo. Now, when it grossed $3.1 that made it the 24th highest grossing documentary of all time at that moment. So I didn't think it would ever get there. But it did get there. And when they paid me what they paid me, it wound up being within about 60 or $70 of what I had spent helping them promote the song and also by going to the Sundance Film Festival and going to New York for the for the movie's um, world premiere there. And I actually went to uh, to Chicago and did a Q&A for the American Bar Foundation. They had a special showing of the uh, film there. I went to Jackson, Mississippi, where I was born, and did a Q&A there when the movie opened there. And I went up to Fayetteville and did a, uh, 
a showing. I don't remember what that was all about. If somebody in Fayetteville asked me if I would come up there and do a Q and A when the movie was up there, so kept up with all my expenses, and it wound up being about seventy five dollars less than what they paid me <laughs> for the song. So, well. I don't know what to say about that. Let me tell everybody you're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with author, teacher, crossword puzzle constructor, and district judge Vic Fleming in Little Rock, Arkansas. Vic, your mother got you, got you interested in crossword puzzles when – this is the part of the show I've been waiting for. Your mother got you interested in crossword puzzles when you were in junior high. How hard were the first ones you began with? You I did, don't remember. You didn't start with ones in the newspaper, did you? I know. I, well uh, – I, I, I will tell you what I do remember. I remember that from the earliest days of my memory, I was drawing mazes and doing quiz, um, trivia questions, quiz questions. I was imi imitating anything that you could see on a game show. I was Jeopardy. Yeah, I was arranging things and questions and answers and things like that. So, I, and I'm sure that in the weekly readers. They probably had little simple crosswords. They did. And I must have shown an interest in that because my mother encouraged me to start working the one in the paper by the time I was in about the ninth grade. And we got in Greenville, Mississippi, we got the Memphis Commercial Appeal. And they had, I didn't realize, I didn't count the number of boxes at the time, but they had a thing called the Thomas Joseph Crossword. And it was 11 by 11 as opposed to 15 by 15, which is what a New York Times is. And I try, did try to work those puzzles to almost every day uh, through junior high and high, or through maybe ninth grade in high school. Ninth grade was junior high at the time. And I always wondered, who is this guy, Thomas Joseph, that writes these crossword puzzles? Well, the Thomas Joseph crossword puzzle, I don't think there ever was a person named Thomas Joseph. Thomas Joseph crossword puzzle is now done by friends of mine that I've made in the last <laughs> 15 years who are in the crossword puzzle. Uh, community mm -hmm. and that same puzzle still appears in the memphis commercial so appeal, if you want so. your kids to start working crossword puzzles i have my grandkids working um sudoku with me and they're fascinated that i work crossword puzzles mm -hmm. um how would you start when i was a kid it was that magazine highlight you remember that magazine mm -hmm. highlight yeah. in the doctor's office so how would what what do you think kids should do today i guess well, they got the internet just the, the, with the internet you can find just about anything mm -hmm. you just google for uh Juvenile crossword puzzles, I there suppose. You go. But uh, a friend of mine in Chicago named Jan Buckner Walker uh, has a, two books out called a Parents Across, Kids Down. Oh. And they are vocabulary crossword puzzles um, where the clues for the across are for adults and the clues for the down ones are for kids. And the idea is that parents and kids will work them together. I and love there are, that. There are ideas to get people, uh, get parents and children working them together. Yeah, that's um, great. That'd be fun. Yeah, she was here uh, promoting those books at the Arkansas Literary Festival about 10 years ago. And um, what was her name again? It's Jan Walker. Parents Across, Kids Down. I like that. We'll put a link on the website also for people at flagandbanner.com. You laid down your crossword puzzle pencil for a while because it is an obsession. It's like a video game. I know you can lose hours working working those crossword puzzles and i read where you lay down your pencil because you were spending you want to spend time on your career is that true well it i, I started uh, making some crossword puzzles i learned the rules and was making some some crossword puzzles in law school and the joke that i like to tell is that i decided it was so time consuming i was going to put it aside until they invented the internet and computers so that i could come back and it wouldn't take quite as long but you didn't. Is that true? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not true that I said I'm going to put it down until. But I did put it. I was going to say, did you have ESP or something? No, I did. Quit and a crystal do, ball? I, I did quit doing it. And um, and I always intended to come back to it. How long did you take a reprieve? It was about 25 years. Now, for somebody who has a love and a hobby for words, that's a big commitment. So you, for 25 years, you quit playing what you would call no, video. I didn't, I didn't quit playing. I continued to solve them. I just quit trying to make them. Oh, I got you. I misunderstood that. Um, so you decided to start making them again. Tell our listeners about the business of crossword puzzle writing. It is a lot harder to get published. It's hard to make one. You tried for years, and eventually you had to hire a mentor. Well, I didn't hire a mentor. I decided in 2003 that I would start making them again. And it took me about eight hours to make a puzzle, and I made one a week for 13 weeks in the latter part of 2000, uh, 2003. I got 13 rejection notes from the New York Times and Will Shorts, and the last one said, you're real close, but you're never going to get there unless you get a mentor. And you, I said, I recommend you go on cruciverb.com. <laughs> cruciverb.com is a 
is a site for crossword puzzle constructors, and they have a list serve. And so I posted on the list serve, would someone be willing to mentor me in uh, constructing crossword puzzles? And the first person to respond was a guy named Peter Abide, who noticing that my username had the word judge in it, Peter Abide said, what is your jurisdiction? Which I took to be uh, a clue that he was a lawyer. So I responded to him, my jurisdiction is district court, Little Rock, Arkansas. By any chance, are you related to the Abide, to, a, to Abides, A-B-I-D-E, his last name, in Greenville, Mississippi, or no. Lake Village, Arkansas? No. And then I thought, you know, he's, there, the chances that he would be are slim and none. He's probably a sophisticated lawyer in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. So I deleted that. I just set up my jurisdiction is Little Rock, Arkansas. So he then replies a couple of hours later and says, Little Rock, I've been there many times. I was born in Lake Village, Arkansas. No! And graduated from high school in Greenville, Mississippi. Turns out that people I grew up playing golf with were his cousins and that his mother was one of my sister's best friends in Lake Village. And he wasn't practicing law in Los Angeles, New York, or Chicago, but rather in Biloxi, Mississippi. You all were destined to meet each other. <laughs> and we've been good friends ever since. I bet. Um, did your wife know him? Didn't she grow up in Lake Village? She knew the family, but he was much younger. Um, what a great story. So there's rules for writing. Uh, you're full of great stories. What a, what You'll have to come back. Because <laughs> uh, we're really just tipping, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg with this guy. He's got some great stories. But um, what are some rules? There's a lot of rules for writing a crossword puzzle. Like, for instance, there's a Sunday morning crossword test. No bodily functions can be in a crossword puzzle. Well, that's all... That, that's not true. That's that's entertainment stuff. But as the as the uh, crossword puzzle grew uh, from its infancy, it mm -hmm. was created in 1913 by a guy named Arthur Wynn, who was a writer for the uh, entertainment page of the New York World newspaper. And he first set it up in the shape of a diamond um, and called it a word cross. And it became immediately popular, and people immediately started submitting their own. It became a freelance uh, uh activity from the get-go and several weeks in uh, the typesetters made an error and reversed the words from word cross to crossword and somehow or other they got some reader feedback and said well that works better and so the, <laughs> the it caught on as a crossword and that was in 1913 and the New York Times at the time wouldn't have anything to do with uh, crossword puzzles it crossword puzzles uh, the New York world actually started syndicating them to papers around the country. And during that period of time, sometime in the late 19-teens, early 1920s, Arkansas had its first crossword puzzle constructor. A woman from Greenwood, Arkansas named Helen Pettigrew uh, had several pub puzzles published uh, in the New York world and they were syndicated. I have a copy of one that appeared in the Los Angeles Times. And she continued to write puzzles into the 1960s and finally had one or two published in the New York Times. So Arkansas has a pretty long history. Uh, but as far as I know, Helen Pettigrew, George, George Rose Smith, and I, although there's one other person, uh, a Mrs. Dalton, who I think lives in Hot Springs, who has recently had a puzzle published in the New York Times. They, they have but feet. I, but I know you're talking about Margaret Ferrer was the crossword editor for Simon & Schuster. I was going to tell you that mm -hmm. in, the, in the Roaring Twenties, in 1924, uh, a guy named Max Schuster um, and his friend Richard Simon, who was Carly Simon's father, hmm. um, I never knew decided that. to form a publishing company. And uh, Carly, uh, Mr. Simon's aunt Wixie had become addicted to crossword puzzles during the 10 years that they had been in existence. And she said, well, if you're going to form a publishing company, you got to publish a book of crossword puzzles, which they didn't want to do. But to satisfy her, they did. Had a little pencil attached to it with a piece of string, and they put it out, and they wouldn't put Simon & Schuster on the book. They created a fictitious publishing name, Garden Publishing. They put the first copy of the first uh, edition of the book out, 1,500 copies, and it sold in like three days. So then they put, it, put out some more and then put, did put Simon & Schuster. The book sold over 700,000 copies in less than a year. <laughs> Back in 1920? In 1924. 
and uh, Simon and Schuster has put out at least one crossword puzzle book every year since then. And the gentleman that you first talked about, who started making the diamond-shaped ones, he didn't keep the copyright to it. Well, no, it it wasn't so much that. I don't think the the form itself. I don't think would be protectable under copyright. His uh, granddaughter was on 60 Minutes one day, and I watched her interview. Really? Huh. I know. I'm surprised you didn't watch that. Well, it's I been mu- a long must, time ago. I must have missed it. But but Margaret Ferrer, who was hired by Simon and Schuster to be their editor, was hired away by the New York Times. And it was she who made most of the early rules. And one of the rules, oh. one of the rules is we don't want any unsavory language in crosswords. Merle Regal came along and called that the Sunday morning breakfast test when hmm. he was interviewed in wordplay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of caught on. Yeah. They have themes. There's a theme, most, most which is puzzle, probably my hardest part. Most puzzles have themes. Yeah, which is probably my hardest part is figuring out what the theme is. Uh, they have square uniformity. You can't just randomly put them together. The, one of the general rules that Margaret Ferrer declared would be that puzzles needed to be symmetrical. So you can turn it any direction. Well, if you turn it upside down, if it's rotational symmetry, it's going to look the same upside down as it does right side up. Which I've never noticed. But there are other types of symmetry as well. And then there are some people who insist on breaking the rules of symmetry. Some oh. editors will allow that, some won't. Which one do you do? Oh, I always do mine are symmetrical. Yeah, I mean, I've occasionally done asymmetrical when the, there's got to be, a, you know, just like any rule, if you're going to break it, there needs to be a reason. Mm-hmm. Just breaking it willy-nilly is not uh, mm-hmm. not a good thing. Wordplay, repetitive le- lettering, and I want to be in a puzzle someday. Oh, Every I time wish I, I s- wish I'd known that. I could have made that happen before today. Oh, well, we'll have to think of an Arkansas flag. And I'll think of one and have you, have you make us one for some, like for maybe the Dreamland Ballroom when we, do our elevator. One of the most fun things I do is make tribute puzzles for people. Like Bill Clinton. Didn't you do one with Bill Clinton? Well, that's one that he and I did together as a part of a New York Times program to celebrate its uh, 75th birthday of the New York Times puzzle. How'd that come about? Well, the New York Times started publishing crossword puzzles in 1942. So 2017 was their 75th birthday. Will Shorts decided... uh, that to celebrate the 75th birthday, um, he would do something unusual. He would get celebrity crossword solved, people who are known to like to solve the New York Times crossword puzzle and match them up with regular contributors to do a series of co-writes, one a month for 12 months. Well, it has continued, but he asked me if I would get uh, in touch with Bill Clinton and see if we could collaborate on one. And we collaborated on one in May of last year. Oh, again? no, no, in May of last year is when we collaborated. On oh, I thought it was a long time ago. You mean no, no. Re- that was recent? Yeah, it was just oh. last year. Oh, I didn't realize that. I was going to show you as recently as uh, three days ago. What? Uh, in the New York Times. You can see that byline. What's it say? Weird Al Yankovic and Eric Berlin. Eric Berlin is a regular contributor. He's a friend of mine. So and Weird, Weird Al. Al- Yank- so they're still doing it. I mean, here it is. Uh, April, uh, and they started it in February last year, and the idea was to do 12, and I know they've done at least 16. So, so I need, what day, is there a specific day those come out? Uh, or no, are they just scattered? different days of the week. Okay. And uh, Will asked me to uh, coordinate with Mr. Clinton to do a themeless puzzle, a puzzle that would be themeless, oh. but would have a political edge. Well, and that so, seems like it has a theme. And so um, Bill and I talked on the phone, and uh, we, a couple of times, and we emailed back and forth. Uh, and we decided to, w- because something just happened to fit, we decided to make, a, make it a themed puzzle but not tell anybody that it was a theme. Now, that's tricky because you have to be able to give an independent clue to each line of something that would otherwise be very clearly a theme. So what we were able to do is we were able to do... In the upper left, uh, the phrase "Don't stop." Okay, eight letters. That's it. That was his song. Well, but "Don't stop." It was a song by Fleetwood Mac that he had it as. He just clued it as "Keep on going." Okay. And then in the middle, "Thinking about," clued as Uh, "Chewing on." And then "Tomorrow," which has eight letters, is in the lower part, just another day. So we had "Don't stop thinking about tomorrow," but didn't tell anybody that it was a theme, and lots of people missed the fact that it was a theme. But I forget, you know, I kind of stumbled on to the fact that that would fit symmetrically. But then as I as I made the uh, the grid for it, I saw that if it was done right, 
a downward letter in the very middle uh, going through uh, thinking about that O that could be e the word economy. So we were able to clue that as it's the blank, stupid. You know, it's the economy, stupid, which uh. was one of uh, Bill Clinton's early campaign slogans. So we had a campaign song and a campaign slogan without telling anybody that that's what it was. And so that wound up being a very popular puzzle. We got a lot of uh, worldwide uh, press on that, uh, mostly because everybody from New York Times test solvers to the average people missed the theme the first go through. And then when they realized it was there, for some reason, it's a great moment. It's a great moment in crosswords when you miss something and you realize, now I got it. That's the quintessential aha moment. Yeah, that's the one I never get. I never, I can do that. Yeah, we're getting close to the end. Um, last week was the tournament for uh, the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament right. hosted in New York. The 41st. 41st. And it was by Will Short, who puts it on Will from Short's, New York Times. Right. He's the He's New the York Times. He's the host. And you said something. You said Eric Agard won. A guy named Eric Agard, who's 24 years old, and he's been coming to that tournament for seven or eight years since he was a teenager. I feel like I've watched him grow up. And he just blew away the seven-time champion, a guy named Dan Fair, who's a musician from uh, San Francisco. Here's a common theme. They're all musicians. They're all writers. They're all... And then, of course, you're all crossword Well, actually, puzzles. you know, if you've watched Wordplay, you probably heard this one guy say that in his observation, the people who do crosswords the best, who solve the best tend to be uh, mathematicians and musicians because they're constantly um, they're constantly interpreting uh, something from one uh, discipline to another, you know, musical notes to actual... They say uh, the music and math are close together. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know. All right. I guess we've got to go. I don't want to go. Y'all, we've been listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I've been speaking with the teacher, crossword puzzles, constructor, Judge... Vic Fleming of the District Court in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, one, we've got to go. We've got three minutes. Who's our? I've just enjoyed you so much. You'll Who's come back, guy? right? Uh, well, sure. Yeah, you like to get them on there. You like to get them while they're get them on air. Get saying them on air yes, saying they'll come it. back. That's legally <laughs> binding, right? <laughs> Tell everybody what he held up. What are those? Four sets of crossed fingers. <laughs> <laughs> That's for crossword puzzles. Uh, who's our guest next week, Tim? Next week is going to be Mr. Greg Hatcher from the Hatcher Insurance Agency. So Greg Hatcher is a, is pretty awesome. I mean, he's really done well. I don't know how small his insurance company was. I don't know how he really began, but I know he's got a great insurance company now, and he has a he's written books. He helps. I'm, I know some personal stories about him because I've gone and seen him speak. But one of the interesting things about him is he brought wrestling to Arkansas. Ooh. He's a, he loves wrestling, and that's one of the reasons you're starting to see a, re, a, surge, a surge of wrestling at schools. It's because he likes it. So if you got, and I guess that's it. Is that all we got to say? Oh, we got a gift. Oh, we got a gift. Sorry, sorry. I almost forgot to give you your gift, Vic. Let's see what it is. I don't even know. Tim picked it out for it's you. A paper bag. That's enough. There's a U.S. flag desk set. Every judge needs a desk set with a U.S. flag on it. Ooh, that's a nice one, We too. got him one of the fringed ones. He got a, oh, a gold base with, with a fringed U.S. flag. That's that great. Thank nice. you so much. You're welcome. That'll look great on a shelf. To our listeners, if you have a great entrepreneurial story that you would like to share, I'd love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info, too. Questions at upyourbusiness.org. And finally, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program's been about you, you're right, but it's also been for me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. Yes. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. If you'd like to hear this program again, next week a podcast will be made available online with links to resources you heard discussed today on today's show. Carrie's goal, to help you live the American dream.